Mary Glenn. Mary Good Glenn, morning. How you doing, mate? Top of the Sunday to you. Sunday? Is it Sunday? Damn. <laughs> it's a day of rest and <laughs> joviality. Yeah, I don't know if we want to do any opening words, but I would just say to anybody who's watching this that if they want to understand where we're coming from, um, if you're new to this, as, as uh, one of my friends would say, um, then I, I think the best thing is to listen to any of the first 15 minutes of Dell's opening in his BTEC Saturday Night Hangouts. I think that will give everybody a very good idea of where the fuck we're coming from and what questions we're asking. <laughs> So oh, that's that out of the way. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> Saved me a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you'd like to have, uh, add any any opening remarks. Yeah, it caught me off guard in a little way. I'm sort of... Um, uh, I'm pretending that somebody might on. actually want to view this, so... <laughs> yeah, I... I've just gone all camera shy, so we're probably going to have to cut this bit anyway. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm just thinking if there's anything else we want to just say in advance before we well, take actually, the topic, work through it, show people our reasoning process, you know, what it is we're thinking and have a little deliverable at the end in the form of a slide or some documents or a picture that people can then refer to and hopefully take what they can from it. Yep. Yeah. I, what the hell are we talking about? Today. Yeah. You mean, yeah. Well, I'd like to just share something that I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have something here. I just happen to earlier. have something I prepared earlier. Um, bring your shared window to the front. Let me see. That would be that one. So can you see that? Yes, I can. Yeah. So I thought this might be a topic that <clears throat> might help people um, make some discernments and, and assist them in um, seeing the deceit um, that is being perpetrated upon all of us. We know for a fact that the globe is absolute childish nonsense. Um, I've heard many people say they always thought that there was something wrong and they always had an inkling. I can't say that for myself. I was sold hook, line and sinker, Glenn. I had Me no too. fucking clue about the deceit um, until I, uh, I woke up, <laughs> uh, dived into it. So um, I just feel that if if it helps other people how should I say, see the process whereby we are inquiring and trying to find out where we went wrong or how we were deceived and um, how to stop it happening again, then maybe just doing a couple of, of, of taking a topic, um, discussing it, um, and as I say, having some deliverable at the end that people can refer to seemed like a good way to start a Sunday morning. Yeah. And I thought we could talk about objects. Probably a good General. place to start. We started, to, as soon as I saw the, saw the word objects, I started thinking about Bill Gady and his definition of physics. And um, his definition of an object. Yeah. Or his definition of physics. Um, yeah, objects are that which have shape. So I've seen yeah. that definition from him. Um, if we're talking about physical objects, then I would agree with that's a pretty good definition. Um, I'd add some more to it though, maybe, um, in terms of the fact that it can move or resist, right? That in its constituent parts and that it's hard or soft. And you know, you could argue that that needs to be part of a definition too, but he seems to have stripped it down to the very basic and says objects are that which have shape. But he only seems to be thinking about um, uh, physical objects when he's talking like that. Is my feeling. I might be wrong, but that's what I understood from him. Well, I, he's, he talks about it in terms of rational physics. So he is talking about just physical objects. Exactly. He, 
yeah. basically saying if you want to talk about objects in a different context, well, you use a different definition. But yep. as far as he's concerned, when you're talking about rational physics, you an, an object is that which has shape. And he's only, he's only talking about the physical aspect. Yep. Well, that's, that's my feeling. I could be wrong. That's just my feeling on it. Yeah, and I think we need to delve deeper than that, right? So let's just question that assumption and see if there is actually any more to it, right? Rather than, you know, he seems to have, you know, looked at one specific aspect, but I feel it's more complicated than that. I agree. I was so, also thinking too that we, we've sort of jumped straight in where we haven't really, you've sort of talked about the deception, but we haven't described anything about what deception um well the, this, i think we did mention the heliocentric global fantasy that we've all been um subjected to did we not no the fact that this earth is definitely not a nature defying sphere pair uh, and we did point yeah. out that you know anybody should look at dale's first 15 minutes of any hangout gonna, i was just going to say yeah you, you didn't actually in we haven't actually mentioned it here but by mentioning that uh dale's little um Intro. Yeah, I understand what you're saying now. Yeah, I'm just trying to save time because he does it, you know, so well. So, <clears throat> yeah. but yeah, I, I deny the globe fantasy. I was a cult believer, right, for a long period of my life. But until you look into it and 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 think for yourself, then you will see that it is a bunch of nonsense. And the question would just be, how the fuck did we end up in that situation? And it's not just that subject either. I don't want to go off onto everything else, but me personally, um, rabid atheist, um, proponent of uh, evolution, um, so sucked into so many of the, what, what I've now discovered are just absolute lies. Bollocks, bollocks yeah. <laughs> yeah, bollocks. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot, uh, Glenn, about, you know, what role, for example, mathematics plays in that, what role philosophy plays in that, and, you know, that these things have been used, if you if, if you know what I mean, whether intentionally or unintentionally, um, to, yeah, to put, put us to sleep um, or to, yeah. to fill our heads full of nonsense until, you know, we're, we're, we've got this far where we don't know where we are, we don't know what it's all about, but we know we're being lied to. We know that the hypothesis that they bring to us denies the facts of lived life. Um, and we know that we can argue from the facts against any such hypothesis that contradicts our reality. Um, and we know that the people who are coming with a hypothesis to contradict the facts must be wrong. I mean, there's no other way to, to see that. It's not proper science, right? So, um, and I just feel that objects and, and having a clear understanding of what an object is and so when we talk about you know objects in the sky or objects on the ground or or you know fantasy objects then that we make those clear distinctions i think it yep. can only help everybody help me Thank anyway you. so fuck everybody else <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that the whole purpose of these discussions is oh sorry yeah it. true <laughs> sorry people <laughs> The, don't take it personally. I was just. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so so let's just dive into it. Or what do you think? Have we made yeah. given enough uh, force spiel? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Good. Right. So you know the first thing, and we've talked about this in various calls. I think Glenn was you know how to divide them. Um, and one of the clear divisions for me would have been physical objects. Um, visible objects, um, and then mental objects would be, for me, um, at least, how should I say, divisions uh, or categories of objects where, where I could get on board with, and I'm trying very hard to think if there's a fourth one. Um, maybe if we'll come to this in a minute, that visible might be too restrictive if we think about all of our sensory organs, but um, so... I, I, I've kind of made three slides. None of them are finished necessarily because I thought it would be a good idea just to go through it and 
um, how should I say, optimize them together with yourself and get feedback. Um, yep. So um, uh, there's three slides basically that I think we could just cover looking at uh, looking at the question of objects in, in kind of different ways. Um, there, there'll be a bit of repetition in there, but it's just to help you know people understand it coming from maybe slightly different approaches, right, or different directions. Um, yeah, so for me, I can't think of a fourth category of object other than the physical ones, um, the visible ones, which belong to our sensory apparatus, and then the mental ones, which would appear to live inside our head. Although I'm not entirely sure that they, they do live inside our head, they might not. What do you think? It's, can you think of any <laughs> other category? <laughs> I can't think of another one at the moment. I am sort of thinking about the question of why why are objects so important? Well, I think when we divide them into categories, it will become apparent why this distinction is important. Because most people, when they hear the word objects, just think about physical objects. That would generally be something that everybody will agree with, right? that an object is usually something physical, something of matter, something substantial, a body of some kind, right? Which, with which you can have an experience and that it's part of an objective reality, physical objects. That would be, I think, the thing that everybody will agree with and say, yeah, that's my common understanding of objects. Right, so the reason we're having this discussion is because we believe that we've been led to believe that there are only one type of object or there is only one type of object. Well, maybe this, 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 this distinction isn't made. Yeah, I don't mm. think the distinction is made, right, between the other kinds of objects. I think most people only know this one and yep. whether that obfuscation or the lack of discernment as to the other ones is one of the problems or, or the why we're in this mess, right? Why people can't properly discern the reality is maybe because they've never thought about the other types of objects that we're about to discuss. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. And it makes me think of that um, quote from Reed where he talks about how physical objects, not, I can't remember the exact words now, but he basically says physical objects have been, you know, studied from every different angle possible for the last 2000 years and nobody's even looked at visible objects. That's absolutely themselves. right. Yep. They, 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 they don't seem to be entertained as a separate thing that you can look at. And I think he's quite right to point that out. Um, and it always has been the subject of, of philosophical thinking is the visible world. I mean, it's, it's not new to just read. Berkeley was saying it, Hume was talking about it. Can oh, in fact most of the philosophers have been looking at this visible world, right? To give it a, a, another name, um, but nobody did it as good as Reed, and it seems to have been ignored after Reed. Yeah. So, yep. and I think it's time well, to pull it back into the attention of people. Yeah. Yeah. What was the quote I was thinking of then? That must have been about. Oh, that was about how the mathematicians haven't haven't looked at it. That's right. So, I mean, he very clearly pointed out people like Descartes and, and, and uh, you know, well, the whole Cartesian, you know, framework um, and Aristotle and everybody else was, you know, wonderfully looking at physical objects. In fact, spherical geometry comes from looking at physical objects, physical balls and, and trying to understand their surface properties. So, yes, uh, people have looked at that, but they haven't looked at the mathematicians. You won't find any axioms, books, papers on visible geometry. It's in the domain of psychologists more than anything else, or neuroscientists nowadays. Brain stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, but not in the not in the context of mental objects. Yeah. So I think you know, in addition to what people would, uh, as a matter of fact, agree that there are physical objects, there are also what Reed called visible objects, visibles, <clears throat> and there are also, as far as I'm concerned, mental objects which are, you know, concepts and ideas. Um, and I'm, I've made this distinction as well, and this comes also from Reed between signs and the things signified. 
because one of the eye openers for me was if you attend to your visible perception and and you see that visible objects are changing all the time as opposed to physical objects which are fixed you know they don't change right if i move one physical object from one place to another it doesn't change its shape or size but if i was to move my eye around the situation of a physical object then the visible object would change its shape and size right so you know there's a very clear difference between those two kinds of objects and that's why we can probably call them objects in their own right yeah because they they are different they have different properties from the physical objects of which you know that, that we're viewing the only thing we don't know is where they are through through i i don't have a definitive statement on that um <laughs> we know that there's a material impression on the back of your retina and that light is you know hitting your physical body uh, in this case the back of a of a um a curved surface of your retina where there are rods and cones and things are happening so we do understand that part the whole of the optical world is built on that principle of understanding that whether it's you wearing glasses or looking through telescopes. So we know yeah. that that is a key part of, of the visible world. But I agree, are those visible objects, if I you know, look at a tree, then I'm not allowed to confuse the thing that I see with the actual object, right? Uh, sorry, this one, uh, the actual body, right? And, and what you're pointing out is that the, the visible object that we see of the tree exactly how far away is it we know the physical body of the tree is is you know outside or you know 10 feet away or whatever but where does the visible actually live is it just you know uh, um, on the back of your retina or is it living within the eye and or some kind of space in between it's very difficult to know the outward distance of any visible object in fact it's impossible to know the outward distance of a visible object but it can't be it can't be a mental object can it no i mean a, a visible object yeah i'm sorry a visible it can't be where the mental objects are well, i think it? there's a differentiation yeah yeah right. and maybe yeah, just to it, qualify it, what it, i it, just it, sorry on you go. i was just thinking you're starting to run into even when I saw the word ideas there, my first thought was, I mean, David Hume. <laughs> um, I just started thinking about that whole battle that was going on in philosophy between Berkeley, Hume and Reed. Idealism ideas. versus realism, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know whether I'm buggering things up here a bit, going all over the place. But, but maybe jumping ahead of ourselves, let's just go take a step back, yeah, just to um, make sure that anybody following this understands what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I mean, let, let's just postulate then that that is, this is a good category: physical objects, visible objects, and mental objects. And let's just clarify what we mean by them. And people can then yeah. make up their own minds whether they would also see these three separations, right? Yep. So physical objects are definitely the matter, the substantial stuff. Um, for me, they, they, there's quite a lot of, of, of properties that come with that. Um, as, we, as we say, they're scalar invariant, right? I can move one body to, to another place and it doesn't change its size or shape, right? Because it's a, a body. Um, I, can, um, I can scale bodies up and down and they don't change their proportions to each other. Um, uh, physical objects in this world of ours are, are you, know, you know, on a fixed planar. We use level and plumb and construction things to, to work with physical objects. That's, you know, demonstrable, practical for the last, you know, thousands of years or however long we've been here. Yeah. Um, physical objects can be touched. They have a figure and an extension. In this case, it's uh, length, area, and volume, right? So you, um, it can be a line, it can be a surface, or it can be a bulk right that has volume um, generally speaking a physical object moves and resists in its constituent parts so i can take it and try and bend it and it might show some resistance it might be really hard it might be flexible right so you know objects have those kind of properties um, 
figured, okay, we already had figures and extensions, so they have length, volume, and stuff. Um, generally speaking, they're colored, whereas whereby we, I might need to be careful about that because that's also part of the visible world. Yeah. But I'm just leaving it in there to begin with because where is the color? Is it in the object or is it only in the visual perception? That's uh, an open, open-ended open question, maybe. Um, generally speaking, they're hard, they're soft. Um, they move and resist, right? Um, yeah. Objects in our world, um, they might be rough and smooth. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that you know you could add to that, right? Um, that are the normal properties of physical objects as we know them in the in the world, right? Nothing, nothing new here. Everybody's experienced a physical object. Yep. Very hard to break down into detail, right? But so well, I. Sorry, Anio. You've sort of really covered that with your tangibles in your original perspective video, really, didn't you? You're just no. going into it in more depth here. As, uh, in a way, we're summarizing things and looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah, I hate using that word, looking at it from a different perspective. It has so many <laughs> quantities. We're, we're trying to, how should I say, describe, uh, um, explain this in a different way. I think that's a better yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. And then we've got the visible objects, which again, we've talked about before. Yes, they have a figure and, and an extension, but we'll see that visible objects don't have volume, right? A visible, visible object only has extension in as much as that it shows length and area. Um, and that's because the visible world is, is spherical as opposed to um, Cartesian or three-dimensional. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not only spherical, it's two-dimensional. Exactly. Well, that's the definition of a sphere, right? Yeah. It's a two-dimensional yeah. object. You know, I know a lot of people confuse the two and even mathematicians do and especially globers do because, you know, they would like to equate a two-dimensional mathematical sphere with a three-dimensional physical ball. And that's where, you know, with a clear separation of those two things, you can see where the differences are and how it's been utilized, right? Well, that, yeah, that gets back to the great switcheroo story where we were discussing those sorts of things. Yep. And I mean, just to show the differences, right? So a visible object is always changing. It's not fixed. Um, it's not planar Euclidean geometry or Cartesian. It's spherical geometry, which has different properties. Um, in the physical world, we use level and plumb. In the mathematical world of spheres, we use great circles and semi-diameters, right? Or what you would call a radius. Um, in, in the physical world, things are scalar invariant. So a triangle will scale up, right? And the proportions of its sides will stay the same. Uh, on a sphere, that's not the case. Um, you will have an excess and a defect above or over 180 degrees on a sphere. Depending on when you blow up the sphere, the angle's gonna change. Um, physical objects are tangible. I can touch them. I can't touch a visible object, right? If I can see the tree in front of me, but you know, I can't actually, you know, get the visible object. Um, we talked about figure and extension. Visible objects are missing one dimension, if you like. They don't have the outward volume part. All they have is length and area. Um, they're colored. Yeah, that's where I said there's definitely some kind of thing that you know overlap here. Is the color in the object, or is the color part of how the eye makes things perceptible? perceptible yeah, yeah. Um, and, and visible objects also have you know a, a visible position which is different from its physical position although the two do have a tie-in right so they share spatial properties in as much as that if I point at something a visible object and then I follow my finger all the way to where I'm pointing I will in fact touch that object at some point given given that it's not you know unreachable to me right so visible position is different from physical location, right? Um, but the two are intimately connected. But it's still to be discerned as different because I know that an object far away is going to change its visible position in my overall perception, right? Yep. Like things are going to lower down, right? Even though I know physically they aren't, right? They're still at the same height. 
all the all the kind of things that you know i think anybody looking at the flat earth hopefully already knows right yeah the thing i was that came to my mind just then was about you've got that i started thinking about the sun we can't actually tell where the sun is if it's a tangible light there's there's two sorts of visible aspect to that there's where it's um, where it's meeting our visible sphere yeah and where i have the feeling that there's another there's something between us that we i don't ever think we're actually ever seeing the actual sun yep this, the, put it this way i've got since we can't get to it right and we have to believe certain institutions and their images and representations of it or theories of it uh, i would agree with you i don't know whether it's it, it itself some kind of projection or or whether it is a real object you know um whatever it is it's moving in the sky and changing its visible position for me that much yeah. i know right and yeah, uh, you know, if you're, if you're honest with yourself, that's all anybody knows, right? Yeah. And that's, and I think that's a that's an important point too, to make about those sorts of things. That a lot of a, a lot of what we know, or, or a lot of a lot of our experience, is just a visible experience. Yep. We don't yep. really know. We don't know. We we can't get to the tangible, to the physical. That's right. All we have yeah. is um, is opticals and visibles that, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, for me, it's it's very clear at least that those things do not have a proper outward distance. There's no way if I'm at the center of a sphere looking at a visible object, and that is the way our eyes work. You know, you're at the center of your own eye looking out. Um, there's no way for you to tell the real physical distance of an object because spherical geometry is only one of surfaces. And that's all you have, the material impression on your, the back of your retina. And there's no way of uh, 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 really knowing what the real physical location, shape, and size of objects are um, through, through, two through a two-dimensional lens, if you like. Yeah? Yeah. <coughs> so, so, so hopefully that's clear to people. And anybody you know, that's been on BTEC will hopefully already know this, and it might just be repetition and then there's the other one the the last one that um, I put up here mental objects which for me are very subjective right um, even visible objects can be subjective because it would depend on where your eye is you know if me and you were both looking at a building from a different situation we would both see different visible objects so in yeah. a way that's also a subjective thing but mental objects are purely subjective right because they really are you know our conception or the ideas that we attain or get from our sensory perceptions and from physical objects um, or they can be completely mental in that I just make them up they're fantasy things right um, inside my head that nobody's ever seen or heard apart from me you know yep. <laughs> the the one-legged farting unicorn right so <laughs> Yeah, so I put in here that these are concepts and ideas, and I've also, you know, taken over the idea of, of signs and not the idea, the, the explanation of signs and things signified that because we don't really pay attention to this part in the middle, the visible world, um, and I'm pretty sure it was Reed that said it, it's very, very difficult to attend to these things because our natural constitution seems to want to make us skip directly from a physical object to a clear conception about it as a mental object. And we tend to skip this part and not really attend to it. Um, as Reed would say, we ignore the signs and we jump immediately to the things signified by them. So we ignore the sign that it actually is a two dimensional spherical object. And we jump directly to the mental um, belief that it is a three dimensional physical ball. Right, so we're kind of jumping over this part in a, in a way and attaching, immediately attaching a belief to, to, to this in our heads that it really is, you know, a space ball as they, as they lie to us, right? 
So, and I've yeah, tried to put some of the, the the keywords or the things that we've discussed in just here as as you know se separated. You know, like yeah, we attach ourselves to us. Um, they're the things that we attend to, or we, we or because we're not attending to certain things, we jump to conclusions too easy. Um, it has to do with our perceptions and beliefs. And maybe most importantly, if you really think about a mental object, it has no shape, it has no size, right? These things do not occupy a space inside your head, right? They, they are not, um, you can't have a thought that weighs a ton. You can't have um, an idea that is a geometrical triangle inside your head in some way. You can see one, you, there are real ones, but if, if you think very carefully about the mental object in your head, it has no shape or size, nor any of the other attributes that we talked about here, hard or soft or moves or resist or rough or smooth. You know, show me a rough thought, you know, give me an idea that resists and has friction, right? You know, you can, you can use all these things in a rhetorical sense, but when you actually think about the mental objects that you have in your head, it has none of those real properties, even though we sometimes misuse the language and associate those kind of adjectives with them. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm still a little bit lost on mental objects. I, I get what you're saying, but, and I understand it. Um, See you, Good night. <laughs> right, yeah. Aye, aye, you're off, aren't you? All right, have a good trip. Huh? Say hello for me. Huh? Yeah. Yep, sorry, Glenn. So you're basically saying that a concept is a mental object. Yeah, it's something we entertain in our heads, right? I can't see it. I can't. I can't let you see it. I can't take it out of my head and give it to you. You can't touch it, right? It's not. You know, it's not a physical thing. You can't see inside my head. I can't even see inside my own fucking head. So there's no way to isolate a thought, a concept, or an idea, and and, and it's, it's it's not physical and it's not visible, right? So for me, the only other category it could be is I'm just going to call it a mental object now. I don't uh, like the term. Sorry? I don't like the term. I'd rather object of thought or, or something yeah. like that. Just the, the whole concept of mental objects. Okay, what, yeah. Uh, well, let's just qualify it a little bit. I've got objects, objects of thought, right? I think that the main what they are, aren't they? It's you only think them. Exactly. But I think the main thing is that you know there's no way to to hold them in my hand. There's no way to view them, and you can't either. So you know they are left as you know subjective, isolated objects of thought in the heads of people or in the minds of people. Yep. I, I, I suppose hence the, the name I gave mental objects, but uh, I, I think objects of thoughts probably a better way of saying it. Yeah. And you might have a, an issue with, I'm just thinking about when people are trying to get a group of people to agree on a concept. Yeah. What's actually happening there? How is physical, ob I mean, mental objects or objects of thought are being shared somehow? Yeah, but we're using language to try and describe, you know, our thoughts. Sometimes people, you know, make images to, I don't know, to try and summarize or make more to make more, I don't know, understandable. They, they'll sketch things or they'll, you know, make a picture or... So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in a way there are some, what's the right word, crossovers between mental objects. 
in that we use analogies of physical and visible objects to try and describe what it is we mean, but the thought itself has no shape or size, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to do it with climate change at the moment in my own head. Okay, go for it. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do people share that object? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason I'm asking that question is because at the moment, it, the world is divided. It's, that there, there are a group of people who have taken on this concept of climate change, and for them, it's a real thing. And for yeah. the rest of us, they're a bunch of morons. <laughs> the, Agreed. The, so, I mean, when you see some of the people that have mental objects or objects of thought that are scary and frightful and fearful, right? If we go back to, you know, young Swedish activists, just to take a, an example, then we see that the objects of thought that she has in her head are completely different from the ones I have in my head. Yeah. about that topic climate change and of course it's predicated on the fact that you know people say that there are physical objects and, and they've measured stuff and they've used mathematics to quantify and 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 they've come to conclusions that you know it must all be catastrophical coming up um we're all going to die um then obviously these objects of thought <laughs> that some people have are yeah how should i say they've been implanted right although there is not necessarily the evidence to support it yeah, see, that's why the thing that was making me think about it was that that the, the, the terminology of object calling it an object does make sense in a way because that object has been used by the climate change proponents they've been able to use that that thing to get people to believe in these other objects. Yep. They've, they've come up with, they've, they've created an object. They've created an object of thought that's called climate change. Yep. And they've used it to build, uh, what would you call it? Uh, well, support a narrative, right? To build a narrative yeah. or story. Create a, business, create a business model. Yeah, create a business <laughs> model of making lots of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and of agenda of power and control, right? I mean, I think half yeah. of it's to do with, you know, making sure oh, or keeping yeah. us all, you know, penned down, right? Or penned yeah. in, sorry. Oh, and, but, but, but one thing you said there that was quite interesting was that the fact that they could be shared. And I would argue that all of those categories of objects can be shared. So sharing, you know, is somehow at least a, a common thread through objects, right? I can share a physical object with you. I could hand you my lighter if you need to have a smoke. Um, yep. I could share a visible object. Glenn, come over here and look at this, right? Yep. Um, and I can share an object of thought in that I try to explain to you through language or, or mathematics, also just another language, um, what that, you know, object is, right? Yeah, actually the difference being that with a physical object you can hand me the object or put my hand on it yep. you can put me in the same position you, you can get me to stand where you were standing to see the other object but yep. with the mental object you have to actually use language yeah there's a disconnect there absolutely there's no yeah. real constant constitution there's no sensory organ employed and there's no material objective physical substance so yeah, yeah. it's it's an ethereal thing right that yeah. is being shared through language yeah yeah but the, and that's the only way i can't sort of stare at you and make it appear in your head yeah or wherever they appear like i was saying before i'm i'm not convinced that all of our thinking goes on in our head i i, I remember that i used to believe that thoughts were the result of chemical interactions within my brain. Yeah, that is the wild, widely held belief, right? But I have no um, definitive. I I can't see that being true at all. I I don't. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I now that I've now that the now that microbiology is been able to show us exactly how a cell 
or not exactly how, but the complexity of a cell and things like that. It's, I'm just absolutely convinced that that just can't be happening. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good point. Uh, you know, is the chemical changes the cause of a thought? Or does uh, chemical, are, are there chemical changes which go along with a thought, right? There's a correlation between the two, but not necessarily in a cause and effect. There's, you know, rationalists or, or is it rationalists? I'm not entirely sure, but would proclaim that it's the, or materia uh, at least would proclaim that um, it's the chemical changes that, you know, cause thoughts, right? But is that, is that true? Ever, have I don't they ever think so. proved that there is actually a correlation? Have they ever actually shown a chemical um, interaction occurring anywhere in the body that goes with a, a thought? Well, they'll say that your brain lights up in some of these wee machines, right? That when you, whatever, you know, hear things, think of something, then different parts of your brain will light up according to neuroscience, right? But so they tell us, they tell us, but, but that's about electrical interactions. Yep. And I suppose, does that mean that they are chemical? That those, that those electrical reactions are caused by electrical interactions? I, <laughs> I honestly don't Good know. Good question. Do I look like a fucking neuroscientist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't. I don't know. What does a neuroscientist look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, okay. I mean, I hope that's just, uh, at least, you know, one way of, of looking at it and people understand where our thought processes are at the moment. I'll, I'll go to the next slide, Willa, which is just going to look at all this in a slightly different no, yep. it's going to try and explain it in a different way. <laughs> so okay. what, what I then thought was, okay, let's just put them into kind of columns and, and see if there's anything more. And so um, again, a little bit of repetition, but we have physicals. And, and, and this is where I thought to myself, well, hold on. We talk always about seeing invisible world, but should we not expand that to, to sensibles? So, you know, should we not just have visible objects, but should we have audible objects, tasteable or um, olfactory objects, right? Uh, tasteable objects or, or and, and touching objects, tangibles we already know about. So that maybe it's even better to, to look further than just pure visibles and talk about sensibles. At least yeah, that was the word I used for it. <laughs> so you've, you've now got, well, actually, are you changing that other category from visible objects to sensible objects? I wasn't sure. I know that's where I came from. My journey was very much looking at visibles and, and understanding that those are definitely different objects from physical objects. And, and now I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I should widen that net and, and talk about audibles and smellables and tasteables and touchables, right? Yes. Just to give them the same, same adjective. Um, and uh, in a way, I think it's true, even though there's a lot of concentration on this first one, right? On visibles. Yeah, if we're, if we're still talking about the deception, I think it, it's, it's the big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the real big one. It's, it, is the, it's, it is the distinction between tangibles and visibles that's the critical issue. And and then how they're made into mentals. <laughs> I should maybe call them mentables. <laughs> <laughs> mentables. But yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's, but, yeah. But, our, but our our experience of the world definitely does entail all of those senses. Yeah. I mean, um, those are the faculties that we come with, right? The if you like, the five senses the five parts of our constitution, which allow us to interact with the objective world out there, which we know is objectively true. It doesn't change for neither me nor you. It doesn't change when I go away, Glenn. So the physical world stays the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, the sensible world is where we play a, an active role, where there's actually a sentient being that comes with those faculties, those offices, right? Um, 
uh, um, and, and uses them to experience the objective reality. So, yeah, I think sensibles is the wider classification of, of, of objects that we should be thinking about, even though our concentration is very much on the, the visible part as, as the one where the deception has been, um, how should I say, founded on. Yeah, I suppose there is a, an, a, an argument maybe for a lot of the deception is done through hearing, um, music, a, yep. lot of, a lot of the brainwashing that's done to young people is done via hearing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm not sure about smelling and, and tasting and touching because they are of a limited range, let's call them. Um, yeah. And these things do have, you know, uh, I'm going to talk now maybe about a sphere of influence. You know how they, they use that phrase, you know, you've got a sphere of influence or when people come into a room, they've got an aura or a presence. And yeah. we definitely have some kind of finite presence, let's say. Right. I mean, if you are physically far removed from me, I've got absolutely no perception of you whatsoever. And, you know, if you were to come towards me, then I would be probably coming down this scale down the way. I would see you first. We might sh shout hello to each other, you know, when you're 100 meters away. Uh, only when you get really close could I smell you, probably. <laughs> um, and, you know, when it gets to tasting and touching, you have to be, you know, right next to me, right? Or physically, yeah. you know, in contact. So that so it's, we it's have different range. ranges or spheres of, of, yeah, range. of influence, oh, ranges, just, right? Range is what I'm thinking. Like with visible, the range is obviously to our, is governed by angular resolution. Yep. Um, hearing is, I wonder, is the sound waves spread out so much as they get further away from the sounding object, the, the object creating the sound? Well, I mean, we know that there's oscillations or beats that when they go really fast, they, you know, have a high pitched sound that we can no longer hear. And also yeah. if things are going really slow, we don't actually discern an audible note, right? To keep it in the yeah. musical terminology that, you know, that's when it changes into a beat and a beat, yeah. you know, might not be noticeable depending on how, how long the interval is in between. So. But, but I agree, you know, that's what, you know, we would call frequencies, right? And we, we have a range again of, of what we can discern. So, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's, one, that's one range, but then you've got the other range, which is the distance away yep. that the sending object is. Yep. Like when you hear something, how far does the sound travel? Yep, you've like, got the rumble of thunder or you've got an explosion that, takes a while to get to you right as it moves through the sound and, and at the end vibrates sometimes you even feel sound if you like not just through your ear but you can feel the vibration in your body right if it was coming via the earth so yeah so you can see on a lot if you're on the Nullarbor plane here on the Nullarbor highway very long straight highway you can see a truck coming but you can't hear it yep not until it gets closer and closer and then you can hear a you can hear a slight noise and that noise gets louder and louder and louder as it gets closer. Yep. So what's actually happening? What, how is that happening? Well, there would um, appear to be a vibration propagating through a medium of some sort of which we are then at the end of the day, you know, sensible to, right? Yeah, I, it must dissipate. It must, if, if, if there's a point at which I can't hear it, I can see it but can't hear it. There's got it's dissipating yep. as it comes towards me. Yep, it loses it's the its power, if you like, in in in, yeah. in in a way, and and we are again not, how should I say, kitted out with uh, enough, um, how should I say, uh, fine detail detail to be able to 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 recognise that anymore. I agree. Same with smelling. Yep, it's, you know, dogs can smell a lot better than we can because they can. When, when you're close to the object creating the smells, there's a lot of molecules in the air 
of that are creating that you know that are creating that smell yeah that, that, that are being diffused is it diffused or that are emanating somehow or another from the from the object making like a rose or something a flower yeah but, but as you get further or further or further away from it the number of molecules the percentage of rose smell molecules in the air around you makes the smell disappear as you get further away from it yeah whereas yep. with tasting yep. tasting and touching well tasting you basically have to touch as well yeah well they do say taste and smell are linked yep they say it's part where you hold your nose you can't taste stuff right yeah so no, I agree. I mean, and, and, and again, that's obviously where our sensory organs um, and maybe just to throw this in, when we talk about common sense, we're also talking about the correlation between five different senses, right? The very yeah. fact that, you know, sometimes only having one sense operating, right? For example, purely visible doesn't give you the full information necessary to actually, you know, um, fully understand your predicament, the object, the situation, the location, all of those things uh, um, are not there if you only have one sense in, in work or, you know, operating. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the, the correlation of senses is, is where we then say, okay, that's definitely true. I saw it, I touched it, I smelt it, I heard it, right? Then that is real. Whereas yeah. only having one of them, it, it's up in the air as to whether it's real or not. See, seeing ghosts, you know, just for the, you know, to take an example, right? Yeah, so again, it's just the, the three different object classifications. This time I've, you know, just set it out in some columns. Um, I, I think this part's all very clear. I'd just like to say a couple of things down here. So when we talk about rational constructions, th this word rational has also to do with ratio. And it's also what we call when we say we're being rational about something. And what exactly does it mean? Well, it means that I can only really rationally construct a three, four, five triangle. There's lots of other possible numbers that I could use to, to, to make Pythagoras work, but not all of them are engineerable because of the, let's say the finite capabilities of the materials and substances which we employ. You know, I can only do things to, let's say, a thousandth of an inch. Or, okay, if I, if I bake some silicon and play with some integrated circuits, then I can get down deeper to, you know, nano sizes, right? Um, but generally speaking, there's always a limit to what is engineerable, and it has to be rational constructs. We can't have repeating decimals that go on forever, right? It's not possible in a finite rational world, right? There has to be some point where we stop, and we can't play with the ghosts of departed quantities, as Berkeley would have said, right? We can't just make things disappear. They actually have to be like whole numbers that are rationally in, in a ratio to each other. Um, and that that's part of the construction of, of this world, right? Um, yep. So, and that's a big difference between at least a physical object and a, and a mathematical mental object. In, in mathematical mental objects, you can play with things like limits to infinity, um, or infinitesimals. I mean, that's the whole, you know, calculus and all those concepts uh, are rooted well, you, in that, right? You can, you can mathematically keep dividing something forever. Exactly. But in our finite, limited world, we know that that's not possible. No. We've, we've, we've had this example before. I walk towards the door. To get to the door, I have to go half the distance to get the next half. You know, mathematically, it would seem as if you never get there, but when you bump your nose in the fucking wall, you know fine well you got there, right? So, yeah. yeah, so I suppose I just wanted to clarify what was meant by rational and engineerable. And obviously, we've had lots of examples of, of that. You know, that, that's a Euclidean geometry, that's our whole world of construction. Um, sensibles, again, I've, I've, I've left it to, to concentrating here on seeing, and we know that there's a visible geometry which is different from the Euclidean planar geometry. This is the world of spherical mathematics. Um, and then we have mental objects where we have man-made formalized languages that try to describe concepts, which is what we said beforehand. I'm um, sharing a mental object with you is me trying to explain using language and very often mathematics and science 
or what they call science um, to, to convey what it is I mean, since you can't see my mental object or touch it. Right. With mathematical... And I'm making a fine distinction between mathematics and geometry and arithmetic, right? Yeah. Because yeah. these are the things that were always there, right? We always counted, we always had planar geometry and mathematics is, is, is this idea of ratios, right? Extrapolated into abstract thoughts um, and, and quantifying things using mathematical man-made concepts. And so I would very always separate between mathematics and mathematical physics uh, as opposed to arithmetic and geometry and rational construction so you're still using numbers but the you're not uh, yeah I'm, I'm still like you are, you, you are making a fine distinction between geometries and mathematics yeah, mathematics is the doctrine of ratio and quantity, right? That's what that's all about. Um, that does apply to geometrical objects as well, but it's an abstract concept that tries to um, go over and above the the, re the real stuff, the arithmetic and the geometry that we use, and and talks about ratios of quantities in a in a more abstract way. So generalized it, it it's been generalized, right? Um, to include things that I don't think are quantifiable. That's where we go into statistics and probability and, and, and things that are not real necessarily. They're averages over time. They're, they're already functions of mathematical thought as opposed yeah. to real objects. I know that that might be difficult for people because it, it's, and maybe I'm putting too fine a distinction on it at this stage at least, but well, hey, I can I only do think... what, what I think. Yeah. I'm just sort of thinking the same thing that people will still put the arithmetic and the geometry under the heading of mathematics because because we don't really understand that it that's not what mathematics really is. Yep, we, said this many a time. It's a formal man-made language based on axioms and assumptions that you know are, are made in people's heads. They, they try and tie it together to physicals and sensibles, but I don't think they've done a good job and I don't think they've properly clarified the matter. And I don't think mathematicians understand the distinctions properly. But I mean, that's yeah. us going back to the fact that we're not taught natural philosophy anymore. We're taught specialized subjects and people yeah. are not seeing the big picture, right? Yeah. And it's um, with arithmetic and Euclidean geometry, the the manipulations you make that, that are made to make rational constructions and engineerables is is um, messed up by mathematics. All these, all that, where they're trying to trying to prove, you know, make make proofs of Euclidean geometries. Um, parallel, parallelisms, you know, the, the, the concept of parallel. Yep. And in actual fact, it's, it's basic and simple. You don't need to go into all those ridiculous proofs. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and just to, to close off this other chapter then, or this this column, sorry, you know, obviously the mentals are the things that we've talked about, ideas, concept, you know, I would put imagination in there, images and, and representations. But, you know, by that you could you could call it, a, you know, a, um, a projection onto a two-dimensional bit of paper when we're talking about, you know, utilizing um, mathematical concepts of celestial spheres and putting them onto maps. Um, you could see representations as, as being um, a represent, you know, philosophically speaking, the representative theory, as opposed to being a, a direct, immediate realist, you could, you know, be an advocate of a representational theory of philosophy, which posits that, you know, there's something in between you and the real world, right? And and you know, my feeling is that that whole representative uh, philosophy is also a red herring, or it's a dead end. 
that you know that we are direct realists. Well, at least I am, right? And yeah. you know, I I don't need a representational theory to account for for how I, you know, live life, right? So. But again, that might be a finer distinction that's maybe only in our heads at the moment, just because of the stuff that we've looked at, Glenn. So I don't want to overemphasize this point at the moment. I'm happy if, if you know, people watching this um, can see these distinctions of mental objects. Uh, sorry, of, of different categories of objects. Yeah. Uh, I'll go on to my next slide, will I? Yep. Again, just another kind of way of trying to look and, and at this whole idea. Um, in this case, I've now, how should I say, um, classified it or, or presented it here in a way that's going from bottom to top. And if you like, you can think of this as the situation or the story or the narrative that we've been told that, you know, we have an earth um, below us and we have outer space above us. Um, I would prefer to call it fantasy. Um, that you know the cosmological narrative of a of a space testicle hurling through a vacuum is as far as i'm concerned complete and utter bullshit um and that this idea of outer space is is a way up above us somehow right and we are way down here on earth and and yeah. that's why i've tried to categorize now these objects um just in the context of the story that we've been told so I'm going away now from the abstract idea of just looking at the, the differentiation of the objects and trying to apply it a little bit to the, the cosmological fairy story that we've been told. Yeah. And I thought it might be a, a nice way of just presenting it. Um, and let me just run through it quickly and then we can go into more detail. But it, it's obvious to me that we can engineer rockets. You know, I can stand with my kids at New Year and, and send a rocket up into the sky. It will burst into flames. I can smell it. I can hear it. And this thing will shoot upwards, you know. It will go from, from zero to 100 in a fairly quick space of time. And at some point, it will fizzle back up and fall back to Earth. Now, I'm, there's no way I'm denying that, right? You know, I can, I can see it and do it and practically demonstrate it. So, so that does work, a rocket, right? But at some point, when we see this idea of the, the, the space nonsense that we're being sold, these rockets go up the way and up the way until at some point they pass all of our sensible um, uh, faculties, right? You know, I, I can't smell it after a while. I can't touch it anymore. I can't hear it. Um, when they tell us that our rocket's going into space, then at some point it reaches our visible boundary or our visible you know, constraint, our range. Um, and that visible constraint is where they very often then, in fact, always cut to CGI pictures and cartoons. Um, and that's where we're then supposed to go into the realm of mental objects and agree with their narrative that uh, what I saw down here on the ground that shot up into the sky is actually going into this, you know, empty vacuum. Um, and I'm supposed to entertain those mental objects in my mind with imagination and images and representations that I'm in outer space and that that's you know part of my reality that there is an outer space out there um, and science fiction and Star Trek and all that nonsense yeah so yeah. I, I was just trying to order the objects in terms of how far away they go from the reality down here on earth so I kind of put them on a scale going upwards um, so again, I'm just another way of trying to bring the point home that there are these three different objects. I quite like this um, diagram. It's um, it does actually show it does yeah it does show that mental that for me that mental progression of uh, going yeah. from. Yeah, by looking at this, I can see where where you're where you're heading. The story you're trying to tell about how you go from, or how there is actually a hierarchy of uh, what would you call them of objects, a hierarchy of objects. Yep. This is this is showing you the hierarchy of objects that go from 
the physicals, through the sensibles, through the mentals. And it, it's a good example, I think, to go to outer space because, and to have listed imagination images and representations because that's how our whole experience of space yep. is, is, is actually, okay, it's visible in as much as it comes to us through our eyes. It's also audible because we hear it. We hear what they're saying. Yep. Smelling and tasting and touching, nah, maybe not so much. Well, they'll show us pictures of them playing with bubbles, yeah? And as you say, we're apparently able to speak to these people out in outer space and sing guitar songs with them. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. They, so, so they give us those um, pre-recorded, if you like. Well, I mean, they'll say it's real time and live, but, you know, let's face it, these things are, let, the recordings and representations, they're not something in our direct reality. So yeah. in a way, they're abusing, again, the visible and the audibles, right, to get us to believe in their mental objects. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's just it. It's, it's, it's a way of using each of these objects as a part of their, a separate part of their deception. They actually build, build the physical rockets. They actually have people in factories who actually build satellites that they believe are going into space. Yep. Um, then we, uh, we are shown images of these people in the factories. And so that's, that's where we get the, the, so we don't actually get the tangible, the guys working in the factory get the tangible, then they themselves in a way, create, create the mental, really, don't they? They're going directly to the mental because they're... It's like, I know satellites exist because my dad works in a factory where they build them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My dad got a paycheck. Yeah, they must <laughs> be real. Yeah. yeah. So, and, it's, and then they go on to the next bit where they have... Um, actors making representations to us. They have yep. clapping and images. shouting and cheering and representing yeah. the, as if it, it was a real scenario that was really happening. Yep. Yeah. So in a way, this is actually a, a good diagram of how the lie is constructed. Yep. Well, I, I hope it helps folk just see through it and are better how should I say, separate the different um, deceptions that are going on and, and how our minds are being abused. Because at the end of the day, that's what's happening. You know, I mean, we've talked about, you know, getting them at a young age, getting them to believe in mental objects, right? Not, yeah. uh, not telling them how the sensible objects actually work. Um, and, and jumping straight from, from, you know, small stuff to mental objects that we believe in and skipping yeah. a, a lot of the knowledge that they should be having, the kids, right, the children, to, to fully understand what's going on. So, yeah, yeah I hope it does. In, in the world at the moment, there would be so few people who understand the concept of visible, even people who work in optics, people who work in, uh, with te building telescopes, people who work in... Uh, just just an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. Yep. Um, even people who are working in technologies, building digital cameras and things like that, they still don't really understand the concept of visible. No, I agree. Well, I'm just going to put another little picture in here just to, to make my point a bit clearer. A firework, I think, just to... Fireworks. Yeah, that looks nice. Can I? Fireworks, fireworks. Wikipedia should be free from any problems, I hope. It's funny, right, I'm just going just gonna to put a, a little image in here. To... Yeah. While you're doing that, I, I was talking to a young woman that I was working with today. Oh, actually, yesterday, 
and we we'd finished work and we were sitting at the bar having a drink yeah and we got into this discussion yeah about the outer space fantasy yeah and she was quite enthralled but what i noticed too was that we were just discussing it i was just discussing it with her and she was going do you really believe that and i said yeah i, I truly do believe that i discussed satellites i discussed having gas pressure have you can't have gas pressure without having a container i talked about how look at this glass the surface of the liquid is level doesn't matter what i scale it up to the water the surface always remains level yeah by the time we'd finished and we spoke for probably an hour and a half or so the entire bar staff and everybody in the bar was listening i'll bet you yeah, because I tell you what, it's a better fucking subject for conversation than just you know knowing what the football result is. Yeah. I know everybody wants to fall back to these kind of mundane things and security and enjoyment, but I think everybody wants to fucking know where they are, Glenn, and what the fuck this is all about. It's a deep-rooted inquiry that doesn't always come to the surface, right? But I think yeah. if you get a, a situation as you're describing. Everybody wants to be part of that discussion because it affects yeah, all of us well, and it interests all of us. Well, I, I think, I've got to say, I think half of them were thinking I was a nutter. Yeah, know, they, to they begin were, with. Yeah. It was sort of, they were sort of looking at me and thinking, or they were listening to what I was saying and thinking, this guy actually really believes that. But they weren't getting overly critical about it. Some were asking questions. You know, a barman would pop his head in and say, yeah, but what about ships disappearing over the horizon? And I said, aha, you've, you've heard about this subject before. You've, you're, um, this is not new to you. And he blushed and said, yeah, okay, yeah, I've sort of been looking into it a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, but, but everybody did, it did, like you say, people were, were interested. They were The barman was reminded me that a while back I had offered to do a an evening at the pub called an evening with a flat earther. Okay. <laughs> Have you not done that um, yet? No. No, I don't think the publican will allow it to happen. He's okay. Not quite that, he's not quite ready for that, I don't think. But yeah, he, um, it was it was actually interesting to to notice that I, that people were interested, that were were intrigued, I'd say. And it's like you were saying before that you know you didn't really know all this stuff in the past that you were right into the cult. Okay, we were right into the cult, but I still believe that most of us, most human beings, know there's something wrong. Yeah. I, Agreed. Uh, can't, nobody can seem to be able. To, people haven't been able to put their finger on it. I think we're amongst the vanguard that has started to realise that there is definitely some deception going on. That that these these things that seem odd actually are odd. Maybe just one thing, I, I've put little circles or ellipses in here, right? To yeah, and, and the idea was just to convey to the people that there are those different limits for each of those sensory organs. Yeah. Um, the idea being obviously that if I'm touching something, then it has to be physically adjacent to my skin, right? So, you know, I, you know whatever I'm touching, it only has a, a, a very small range of influence or um, influence is not the right word. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And w w when I go to tasteables, I wasn't quite sure where to put it because I'm not a lizard that can shoot out my tongue to any great extent. But so in a way, touchable and tasteable are probably, you know, very much the bottom layer, you know, which and they don't have much finite extension in the three dimensional world. 
whereas smellables and audibles and visibles would appear to me at least to be successively larger ranges, which is why yeah. I've, I've drawn, drawn them, you know, going outward and, and having a greater range, if you like. And for me, it seems that, you know, the big deception is where our visual perception, you know, uh, uh, limits are reached where we go beyond the imaginary curve, where we go beyond the, the, the sky dome that we see at night, or the spherical yeah. dome, and, and that's where we go into the land of mental objects. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ev even, you know, I've thought also a bit about, you know, the dream world. There's been quite a lot of discussion about how sometimes people have those, um, and I've had them too, but not to the extent maybe that other people have had them, you know, when you wake up in the middle of the, uh, or you wake up in the morning and you're not quite in your body, so to speak, and and you're thinking to yourself, "Oh, I can't breathe," and then and then all of a sudden you come back to reality, if you know what I mean. Where yeah. where it appears to me that the sensibles are all switched off when you're sleeping, right? Yeah, yeah. The dream world would appear to be a mental one, you know, purely mental one, and and you're disconnected from the sensible in the physical world when you're in a dream state, yeah. And that yep. maybe some of those things that happen to people is a kind of successive coming back down from the mental world into the sensible world and back to the physical world. And that you ha you then have those effects that people sometimes have, right? Um, yep. Makes uh, sense. I mean, I, I know there's quite a lot of theories on this out of body experiences and all that. Um, but it would seem to me to be a little bit that, you know, your offices of, of, certain offices are switched off, right? They're shut for the day or they're shut for the day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't feel myself breathing. I can't see anything until I open my eyes. You know, all these things are not available to me in the mental world. And in the mental world, I can fly and, and I can whatever, you know, materialize or teleport from one place to another without having traveling in between or any time noticeable. So, so it, it's, um, you know what I mean, right? I'm maybe repeating yeah. myself here. <clears throat> Well, I'm personally convinced that the the creature that we are actually lives outside the body. Um, I entertain those thoughts as well, but I've got no evidence. No, I yeah, same here. I I just sort of think that it's it's the body is something that you put on in the morning when you wake up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I mean, you could switch it around. We had the discussion, I think, just before we came online about the matrix in reverse. But you know, yeah. maybe the mental world is the the real world, right? And when our suit kicks in and the sensibles come, and and we have this finite, you know, objective construction in which we live, that that is theoretically the 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 unreal part. And that you know, if I go back to our discussion about the mental part being infinite and unlimited then and and we're here experiencing a finite and limited reality for a period of time yeah an adventure a ride an amusement park whatever you want to call it um yeah. you know maybe that's the other way around maybe this is the real life yeah it's like pulling on one of those gloves those uh, what do you call them the the gloves where you where, if, if the gloves just sitting there on the ground and nothing's happening but if you put the glove on, you can actually manipulate things on your computer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the yeah the virtual worlds. I actually saw this is just a side note or nothing, but I I, I saw a, a video online. I think it was the Leicester football team, and they were to put on three dimensional glasses, uh, a three dimensional you know have an augmented reality, and yeah. they were transported into a lift. Um, and they got to the top of the lift and then they had to walk the plank and fall down, uh -huh. right? And I mean, the, you can see these grown men in trepidation and fear. I mean, the, the, you know, the, they were kind of like stepping on the floor, you know, and, and trying to hold on to things, you know, because in the augmented reality, they actually then fell, right? So they had this idea of falling. Obviously, physically, nothing was happening to them. They were standing on the carpet in the room, right? But... I mean, you can see how, how much effect it had on them, you know? I mean, and I've tried yeah. those things myself on one of these roller coasters, and I had to sit down in a chair. And, you know, to be honest, I had to cheat and shut my eyes sometimes because it was, it was making me uncomfortable and uneasy, yeah. right? So it's, uh, yeah.
And I mean, <laughs> have you seen those videos of people walking across glass bridges? Yeah, the the visual. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, yeah. But maybe the experiments also with kids and stuff. Oh, just no. They, oh, right, right. Oh, you mean the, the people are just terrified, and even yeah. animals, dogs won't cross them. Yeah. Um, and then they have these um, um, uh, um, cracks that appear. To, to really frighten the people that they, they've got <laughs> visual cracks that then appear in the glass and people are jumping back. Yeah. And no, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, some of them, they, the people are just hanging on for dear life and crying and yep. screaming. And the other people are just walking across, but some people are just absolutely terrified. And, and that's, you know, it's a very good point. I mean, if anybody would deny that, you know, the visibles, like visible objects can have so much influence on us, then they just need to look at these videos and see how yeah. people can be inserted into states of fear, um, yeah. you know, just purely by a visible phenomena. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, I was just thinking about with that list there, maybe tangible should go after audibles. Yeah. Only because I was thinking about it in terms of how you, how, why they, what, why we have those sensor, senses. The, yeah. it's about protecting yourself in this environment. Yeah. It's about, first of all, you see the danger or you hear the danger. Yeah. I, I, they could be interchangeable too. Then you might smell it. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, I think testable is probably for me right at the bottom. Yeah, tasteable at the right bottom because that I was thinking about if you the last if you if you look at a um, plant you can look at a I actually read again sorry but it, where he talks about the potato plant and the salernum and he yep. says they look the same. Yeah. So you could look at it and it looks the same. You touch it and it feels the same. Yeah. You can't you can't hear it. But then you smell it, it smell, they smell different. And then when you taste them, you can tell what the one's poisonous. Yep. Um, no, it's a good point. So, yeah, I, to, so I put tasteables at the bottom because I think that's probably the one that, at least in terms of range, um, yeah. is the most limited, right? Yep. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put terming it in in uh, levels of range yep your longest yeah, so. range your longest range sense is visible next is audible then smellable then touchable then tasteable yep and maybe just one thing again just to note down here so you know i put very clearly in here that um that our constitution, our organs of sense, our whole makeup, our physiology is of physical substance and matter. <clears throat> and that when we refer to all those senses um, being common to every one of us, i.e., you know, I don't know of a, well, uh, aside from impairments and, and, and diseases that people might have, um, we all share those sensibles. Um, so we have them in common. Um, and those are senses with which we can all be scientists you know, yeah. um, and that none of us have any difference. And that, yeah. you know, obviously there's always a sentient being involved in making those distinctions of objects, right? I, I couldn't ask a cat to understand what I'm saying, right? It has to be a sentient being that shares the same senses as me for us to yeah. have this discussion at all, yeah? So exactly. I just want to point that out. I'm going to stop there, the share at this point, Glenn, because yeah. I feel we've probably covered what we wanted to cover and I can put three slides into the Google drive for people to reference to or do as they wish, um, use yeah. as they wish. And um, yeah, I've enjoyed this conversation. So I would stop recording now. And um, okay. do you want to say bye bye to everybody on a Sunday? <laughs> bye bye. Have a nice Sunday, everybody. <laughs> so I'll just stop the recording.